Wayne. Thank you. I'd like to read tonight two sections, one long and one short. Uh, the first section, the longer section, concerns a documentary filmmaker named Strickland. Uh, this novel has two, two, a number of principal characters, three principal characters, two of whom are Strickland, the documentary filmmaker who is a man of the world, and uh, a yacht salesman by the name of Brown who is not. Well, the first section is about Strickland. Strickland has had difficult times in his life. He has a stammer. And as this narrative picks him up, he's just returning from Central America where he's, uh, he's been making a documentary film. In the taxi from LaGuardia, Strickland had the persistent notion of being followed. He rode with one knee up on the back seat, guarding the road behind. He had noticed a man in the bar at Miami Airport watching him, a man he was sure had boarded his flight in Belize. Between Miami and New York, he had been upgraded to first class, only to find the same tall mestizo in a seat across the aisle. As his cab mounted the Greensboro Bridge, his eye was on a Ford Falcon that had left the expressway just behind him. A dark-haired man in sunglasses was at the wheel. A second man of similar appearance sat beside him. All the way across the bridge, Strickland kept watch, reflecting that there was no more sinister sight in all of the hemisphere than two tall Latinos in a Ford Falcon. It made you want to pray. When the Ford eased past them to leave the FDR at 116th Street, he turned his face away. Driving downtown, Strickland had a gander at his driver, whose name was presented on the hack license as Chiasm Chakru. He had a bald, bullet head and fierce, lustrous eyes, behind which burned the fires of Shia, or drugs, or plain madness. So, so what do you think, Chiasm? Strickland inquired. You like New York? Chiasm Chakru stared at him in the mirror, apparently with rage. No. They had taken the 48th Street exit and went deep in gridlock. Strickland was already weary of his new conversation. Where do you like them? The driver ignored him. Strickland's premises were in Hell's Kitchen, just west of 9th Avenue. He got out on the corner, took his bag from the trunk, and paid off Chiasm. On his way to the building, Strickland was approached by a lost soul who had been begging from passing cars with a styrofoam cup. He sidled past the man, but then thought better of it. Pausing, he filled the man's cup with his Central American small change. He let himself in through the metal street door, leaned against the moldering green wall of the first landing, and pressed the elevator button. The elevator arrived, complete with Jaime, the Colombian super, who, seeing Strickland, stepped back in stylized surprise. Hey, where you been? Atlantic City, Strickland told him. Yeah, Jaime said, stepping out of his way. I know where you've been. Strickland maintained half of the eighth floor of his building, which had been a musical instrument factory long ago. His place consisted of two cutting rooms, a small office, and a big loft space in which he had his living quarters. Coming up to the door of his shop, he heard a radio playing inside. He pounded on the door, and after a moment, someone came, to the <coughs> came and listened by it. Yes, please, demanded a nasal, impertinent tone. It's me, Hershey. Open the door. The medico lock and the deadbolt were undone, and Hershey stood before Strickland, bowing and rubbing his hands together. Hershey was an apprentice editor, an awkward youth of frail and scholarly appearance. Welcome, master, Hershey intoned. It pleased him to assume the demeanor of a freakish laboratory assistant in a horror movie, a role for which he was, in fact, well suited. What's happening, Strickland asked him. Everything arrived? I think so, six reels. Good, Strickland said. Got it all synced up? We're not quite caught up, Hershey told him. He took off his glasses and wiped them on a tissue, squinting in the fluorescent light. I've been working by myself all this week. Sheila's been out of town. I'll give her out of town, Strickland said. He went back into his quarters, showered and changed. As he dressed, he listened to his message machine for a while. He soon shut it off. The messages were boring, and he was not in the mood to talk on the phone. Back in the cutting room, he found Hershey at the Steenbach, working to the creepy contemporary music he favored. Knock off, Hershey. I want to see what I have. The moment of truth, Hershey said. He stood up and assumed a parody of a servile cringe. Truth is right, Strickland said. 
They sat and watched selections from the rough cut of Strickland's Central American documentary. There were scenes of political rallies sponsored by the party in power, of religious processions and of volunteers for the harvest. There were sensitive studies of the dead. There were views from the door of a moving helicopter that raced its shadow over the savannah in a ghostly reference to Vietnam, of flamingos rising in thousands from a mountain lake, and of pre-Columbian ruins, somber and murderous. There were, and there were interviews of every sort. Christ her, she said, watching an American diplomat attempting to explain himself. You really open them up. I get them to spread, Strickland said. That I do. They watched the brother of a cabinet minister sounding a little worse for rum, attempt to explain what could not be explained to a camera. Hershey giggled asthmatically. Doesn't he know you're shooting? Sure he knows, and then again he doesn't. After about an hour of film, Strickland threw the switch on his rough cut. That's about all I can take, he told Hershey. The pungent odor of the real thing. He clapped his hands. We're in business. Take a bow, big guy, Hershey said. Strickland reflected that Hershey, although distractingly obnoxious, was a gifted cutter. They were on the same wavelength. They're so urgent, Hershey said admiringly, and they always blow it. How do you do that? Strickland rounded at him. You don't understand, do you? Do you really think it's me getting them to look bad? On the contrary, my man. They piss all over themselves. I clean up their act. Hershey was chastened. He took off his fixed lens glasses again and wiped them on a sight saver. It's hard to tell the good guys from the bad guys. Hey, I decide who the good guys are, Hershey. When you learn how to cut film, you'll decide. Really, Hershey asked. Find out for yourself. Hershey laughed as though Strickland were kidding. Preparing to go, he put, on a, he put a jacket over his black Rising Sun Banzai t-shirt. In the front pocket of the jacket, he carried three ballpoint pens as a joke. Basically, Hershey was a young hipster with an Astor Place haircut and suits of Milanese drape. Alone in his cutting room, Strickland ran another reel in sections, fast forwarding from time to time. The scenes with birds struck him particularly. The rising flamingos, swallows and a cactus, doves and vultures in the palm trees. He could not account for all the footage of birds he saw. Mythic and heraldic notions occurred to him. He whistled Paloma between his teeth. There was a way in which the birds proclaimed the country. Most ineffable were the frames which featured the dead. The corpses in the film fascinated for reasons beyond the drama and violence they necessarily represented. Strickland pondered the way in which dead people always appeared in complicity with their circumstances, no matter how bizarre the setting or how advanced the state of their decomposition. In a way, he thought it was almost reassuring. It made you think, if they can have that happen to them and look so cool about it afterwards, so can I. He went into his living loft, brought out his marijuana and rolled a joint. Then smoking, he ran the footage he had watched earlier with Hershey. The interviews amazed him. People had no discretion. He sat at his machine, hugging his shoulders, rocking in solitary laughter. He kept imagining fade-outs that would bring birds back to the screen, a comment on the babble and confusion on the field of folk. Strickland's spirits rose. He was encouraged for the work ahead. What a piece of work is man, he thought. Late that night, lying on his bed, smoking the last of last summer's marijuana, he decided to call Pamela Kester. Pamela was the employee of an escort service who had figured prominently in a highly regarded document documentary on New York lowlife that Strickland had made three years before. She was his sometime connection, and they had entered into a relationship. Hello, Pamela, he said when he had her on the line. Big Buddy's back. Hey, Big Buddy, Pamela called with faint enthusiasm when you get back. Just now, Strickland said, today. Just now, Pamela said, and you're calling me already? What a pal. So Strickland said, come over, bring something. Two, maybe three o'clock, how's that? I can't stay long. Can we watch something? We'll have one of our talks. Can't you make it earlier? Uh-uh, Pamela said. She clicked her tongue reflectively. Now this is really embarrassing, and please don't think I'm sordid, but I have to ask you for a credit card number. Isn't that awful? For appearances sake. Christ's sakes, Strickland grumbled. He got out his wallet and read her the number. He was almost asleep when the downstairs bell rang hours later, half dreaming of all the birds. He rode the elevator down to the street door. Hey, you're constant, Pamela said to him. She turned and signaled to dismiss the taxi that had brought her, calling up your first night back in town. 
She was wearing a black beret, a sheepskin jacket with a woolly collar, and expensive cowboy boots with fancy stitching. The beret, together with her large frame spectacles and the leather portfolio she carried, gave her an appearance of upper bohemian wholesomeness. She had been a sensation in Strickland's movie because she was so attractive and reasonably well-spoken and generally unlike the common representation of a prostitute on film. The film was called Under the Life from someone's cute remark. As they rode upstairs, Strickland asked Pamela what was new. I was home, she said, I mean in Connecticut, watching my father like prepare for death. Yes, Strickland asked, what does he do? Well, he gardens. He, he writes letters to the town zoning board. What a guy, Strickland said. So you were down in South America, huh? How was that? Go, go dancing? Score coke? The birds were great, he told her. She loved the line. She repeated it. The birds were great. You're unreal, Strickland. Hey, I'm really sorry about the card, she added. I have to placate Junior. Junior was the Lebanese proprietor of the escort service with whom Pamela had started out, another true life performer in Strickland's movie. Everyone thought him beneath her. And how is Junior, he asked her. I want to hear all about it. Really? Okay, she laughed, being a good sport about it, and handed Strickland a two-ounce baggie of marijuana that had been pressed flat in her portfolio. Then she excused herself to go to the bathroom. He could imagine her fingers prowling his medicine cabinet. When she came out, they sat down in Strickland's office. Behind his desk, there was an enormous round window into which the instrument manufacturer's corporate coat of arms had been leaded. Over the rooftops of Clinton and Chelsea, they could see the towers of the World Trade Center and even a few faint winter stars. Strickland lighted a joint and turned his tape recorder on. Junior's terminal, Pamela declared. She spoke to the recorder with a kind of wicked excitement. He's paranoid. He thinks everything went bad for him since he was in your movie. He thinks you owe him. That's funny, Strickland said. He, he says I have no respect. She held her breath on the joke. He says I, look, I make him look bad. He smokes crack. He gets yeast infections. And I think either, is, either he's taken a lot of antibiotics for syphilis or he's got AIDS. Very good, Pamela. He's finished. She raised her voice and pawed the air, pulling the plug on Junior. Yeah. We're talking liberation, she cried. Then suddenly she seemed to step, as it were, out of character. How's that, she asked Strickland. Strickland applauded silently, palm to palm. Wonderful, he said soothingly. I wish I had it on film. She looked at him sidewise, green-eyed. In the space of the moment, it was possible to see how crazy she was. You, Strickland, she recited in a childish croon, always looking at me. I see your ass. Know what I see, Strickland asked. I see how cold your eyes are. She covered her eyes with her hand. Don't say that, she said. Like a predatory fish, he thought. Like a pike you can grab by the eyes. Dangerous, but he felt in control. How about letting me shoot you, Pamela? No, she whimpered. Come on. Just with a video camera. What would it be, she asked plaintively. Look at the hoe? No, she said. You see what it is, Pamela? You take all those drugs together and your mind's a fucking omelet. I want to put you on film again, man. She laughed and pouted. No. Maybe I should intimidate you. Maybe I should call you bitch. Pamela clenched her teeth and shook her head. Maybe I should say, let's roll him, bitch. Yell at you. Maybe then we could work. She looked away. Tie you up or something, because you like that. Childlike again, her anguish dissolved in a giggle. He had made her laugh. Strickland, exasperated but affectionate. Strickland, goddammit. What you refuse to understand, Pamela, is that I propose a flick that is you entirely. I mean, I would like to do a whole mixed media thing. All you, to be entitled. Pamela, don't you think that would be radical? I don't believe you. Ah, uh -huh, Strickland said, then you're mistaken, because I don't make jokes about my projects. Really? Pamela, how can I persuade you? Listen, Strickland, she said suddenly, I'm really sorry about courting you. I'm with these awful people. I'm never reluctant to pay for conversation, Strickland assured her. It's sex I won't pay for. She was at the stage of making faces. She put out her lip, a tragic mask. Don't you like sex, Strickland? Hey, Strickland said, this is sex. Then she went to the bathroom again. While she was doing whatever she did, Strickland looked through his stores for something to catch her fancy. In the bottom drawer of a file cabinet, he found an ancient wire recording of a radio talk show in which he had participated as a child. 
It was an item he had gone to much trouble to obtain the previous year. Hell, he thought I'll squander it. He dusted the spool and put it on. Pamela came out of the bathroom looking flushed and wet-lipped. I have to go, she cried, but in a moment, she cocked an ear. Hey, what's this? They listened to the dulcet tones of Strickland's dead mother as she described her dedication to the education of youth. The host replied in an old-time corny accent, a vanished mode of speech full of secret inflections. Strickland heard his own adolescent voice. He sounded a little like the carny, and that was all wrong because he and his mother were supposed to be squares. Pamela was quite taken with what she heard. What is that, she asked happily. It takes a little explaining, he told her. I want to thank all the p p p people out there for helping us, Strickland heard his own adolescent voice say. Who is it, Strickland? It's all radio, Pamela. The voice is mine. The woman is my late mother. Wah, she demanded. Suddenly he was tired of hearing it. It had not been really such a good idea. Only high had he imagined her an appropriate audience. He turned it off. It was made in an old studio above New Amsterdam, he explained wearily, right up the block there. My mother and I were begging. We were being the deserving poor. It was the Max Lewis show. People would call in one and two dollar pledges. She was looking at him, mouth agape. I mean, he said, what can I tell you? It all happened before you were born. But that's terrific, Strickland. You and your mom, huh? Me and mom. That's so sweet. The two of you on the radio. Who would have thought you had a mother? You know, Pamela Strickland said there's an old theatrical adage, dying is easy, comedy is hard. She stared at him. That's a threat. She seemed delighted. You threatened me. Nonsense. I'm not scared of you, you know. Yes, he said, I know. Her quivering smile defied him. Would you really make a movie with just me in it? Yes, he said patiently. It would be my next venture. Just me? Long shots? Close-ups? Nothing in this picture but me? They call it Pamela. It sounds avant-garde. Strickland shrugged modestly. I don't know, she said. I don't know what to do. Can I look at footage of myself? I thought you had to go. Please, please, she said. So he set up a collection of outtakes from Under the Life, which had been synced for her perusal. He left her in the office watching herself on the steam dock. Back in the living loft, he took his shoes off and lay back on the bed. From the editing room where Pamela was watching herself, barks and whoops resounded together with loud groans that rose in crescendo and dissolved in ululation. He was wondering whether it might really be feasible to make another documentary feature around Pamela alone. He had always wanted to try making a one-person film. With her, he thought, it would be naughty work. How to penetrate that busy swarm of verbiage and gesture and find the shiny animal within. How to bring it stunned and dripping into light. But what a worthy lesson for the world to glimpse what thrived in the airless inner life of just one particular whore. It would be every bit as striking as your pet cemetery films. There would be the same uneasiness at what teemed there under the crust. They would see its shadows cast upon her pleasant face. The trouble was, he thought, that he might be accused of repeating himself. They might say, whores again. Half the time they had no idea what they were looking at. Strickland's half-stoned reverie eased him into fragile sleep. Within minutes, he woke to see Pamela in his living room. She stood by the window, her face close to the glass. The sky above New York was growing light. On her face, caught perfectly by the morning's faint radiance, was an expression like a child's. Standing there, he thought, she looked for all the world as though the morning light could somehow save her. She seemed through the homely offices of shadow and line, hopeful and expectant. It was a fetching, and he thought. It was it was fetching, and he thought a little about how to nail down such a look. Pamela turned and caught him watching her. Look, she said, it's light. Could we have some music? He looked at her without answering. I'm cold, she said. Could I come and sit on the bed? No, he said gently, and it's not cold. Oh, she said, you're a rat, Strickland. She was showing him her streaked, druggy face, that wrapped, snotty, cotton candy smile. All the same, he saw a real desperation there. The whore in the morning, facing bed in earnest. You're a rat, Strickland, she said teasingly. She was playing at playing games. Aren't you going to come and hold my hand? Pamela, doll, what do you want from me? I want someone to hold my hand, she said. No doubt she does, he thought. Her eyes were vacant. She looked mournful and fey, and indeed vulnerable. Everybody's little sister, Sue. 
It was that time of day. Give me a break, he said to her. Strickland is the unsympathetic sensibility against which the lives of the other people in this novel unfold. But he's good at persuading people that he's less unsympathetic than he really is. And he persuades a man in an endurance race to allow him to film his family while he's at sea and to film the preparations for his voyage. And while Strickland is ashore filming his family, uh, Brown, this endurance sailor, is at sea. 